Raylan Kuo, the director of a Taiwan Policy Initiative as senior a political scientist at Rand Corporation. Uh, Raymond, the polls are uh, pointing to a tight contest, even with the divided opposition, that is. Uh, talk to us about the key pivotal factors that might impact the race's outcome in the final stretch before the election. Sure thing. And so there's a bit of a polling blackout that Taiwan, the Taiwanese government imposes over the last 10 days of the election. So we really don't have a good sense of where the electorate is. But I don't think I see anything that's happened in the past few days that will really shift where the polls are right now, uh, where they were 10 days ago. Uh, Lai Ching, the, the uh, DPP candidate, is likely to win. Uh, probably by a margin of about four and a half to maybe six percent. Uh, but I think the real question here is what happens in the legislature? Uh, the DPP currently holds a majority of seats there, and they've been able to do quite a bit in their last four years. But they're more than likely to lose that majority. And the question is, who ends up getting a plurality? And where do the third parties stand at the end of this election? Mm. Raymond, Beijing has warned voters to make the right choice, and Chinese jets and ships are constant presence near Taiwan. I mean, we know this is not new, but I want to ask you whether the warnings have taken on a new dimension because of, you know, heightened international awareness, you know, of the Taiwan Strait and also its importance globally? That's a great question. I think uh, the answer is generally no. The Taiwanese have faced this sort of coercion uh, in the past, in past elections, uh, in 1995, 1986, China actually fired missiles over the island. Uh, you know, over the course of the last two years, uh, certainly since Pelosi's visit in 2022, we've seen increasing incursions by Chinese forces into China, Taiwanese airspace and across the median line, the unofficial border between Taiwan and China. Uh, generally on the ground here, you know, people seem pretty calm. You know, you have to go on with your lives. You have to, you know, uh, make your salary, feed your kids. Uh, and there's no sense in which I get from the Taiwanese that they feel like they have to constantly worried about this. They just have to get them with their lives. Uh, and so I don't think it's going to have much of an effect on the Chinese coercion. It's not going to have much of an effect on the election. And in fact, when they do these things, uh, studies have found that it simply drives more uh, interest in the DPP. Raymond, what about Hong Kong, though? Are voters in Taiwan looking at events there with increased wariness or, or has that basically faded from their concerns and memories? No, not at all. I mean, I think the 2019, 2020 protests and the the kind of the crackdown that happened uh, during that time is very much on people's minds. Uh, you know, as China touts one country, two systems, uh, as the Taiwanese debate uh, the 92 consensus, Hong Kong's very much in mind. Can the Taiwanese people trust the promises that China provides about having their own autonomy, having their own uh, government? Uh, and the answer, frankly, is no. Uh, you know. Hong Kong was promised, I think, 20, uh, 50 years, and they didn't get to 20. Uh, and so, you know, the Hong Kong example was, I think, pivotal to Tsai Ing-wen winning in 2020. It still has very much of an effect right now in terms of how the Taiwanese view Chinese promises. And Raymond, if, let's say, Lai is to win, how do you expect him to manage relations with both the U.S. and China amid this heightened risk of conflict? And what could be the best case and worst case scenarios for the island under him? Sure. I mean, the worst case scenarios, it's, it's a bit hard to say. I mean, certainly invasion and destruction will be the worst case, although I don't think that's very likely. I think the more likely worst case scenario, and again, not very likely as well, would be some kind of blockade, uh, probably temporary by the Chinese. Um, in terms of the best case scenario and how uh, Lai Xingde kind of navigates the U.S. and China relations, I think the pick of Xiao Bikim was a, a good one for the vice president, his uh, vice presidential pick. You know, she was the uh, unofficial Taiwanese ambassador to the United States uh, for the past I think, three to four years. Uh, and by all accounts, has done a fantastic job in that role, uh, building stronger relations between China, uh, the United States on one hand and Taiwan on the other, both in terms of security cooperation as well as economic cooperation. And so I would actually expect a lot of that to continue, continue forward with her in the vice presidency and a fairly deep bench within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, Taiwan's going to be able to navigate at least its relationship with the United States, I think, particularly well. And that's important because it will offset a, a almost inevitable deterioration in relations between China and Taiwan. If China refuses to speak to any DPP government. I don't expect them to change that policy at all. Um, and in fact, we'll probably see the sort of continuation of the trend line of increasing coercion against Taiwan over the course of the next, over the course of the next uh, allied administration, if it comes out.
And not only cross-trade relations, but the, uh, but the economic future is also on voters' minds. Uh, what sort of specific differences exist among these three candidates and their approaches to economic policies? And how might these impact the voters' choices? Sure. Um, I'll focus on the KMT candidate Ho Yui and uh, the DPP candidate Lai ching William Lai. Um, and I think the real difference here is what type of economic relationship does Taiwan want to have with China? Right now, with a a possible Chinese economic slowdown, the DPP is seeing some fruit from its new southbound policy, the idea that Taiwan wants to diversify its trading partners, especially in Southeast Asia. By contrast, uh, the KMT candidate Ho has raised the idea of a, uh, renewing cross-strait economic agreements, and so therefore tying Taiwan's economy again more closely to the Chinese economy. It's a fairly clear difference between the two parties, or at least the two candidates. I think a lot of it is going to depend on the implementation. Right now, Taiwan and the United States are speaking on the, uh, I think it's the 21st century agreement on uh, uh, economic agreement framework. Uh, if that gets passed, and uh, fingers crossed it does over the course of next year, that should have a pretty strong impact on Taiwanese economic relations, tying them more closely to the United States. Raymond, I want to ask you about Washington's position. It's come out to say, you know, it will not be changed regardless of who wins. I can see, you know, that being the case if William Lai wins. But if the KMT wins and Ho Yui starts to unwind, you know, some of the policies that Tsai Ing-wen put in place over her previous two terms, mm -hmm. I mean, surely that would mean some form of adjustment on the part of D.C.? It could, although I think there are constraints on uh, any sort of Ho administration in changing the kind of turn uh, towards the recent turn or the longer term turn towards the United States. Remember, the DPP has been in power for eight years. They've had a legislative majority for the last four. These things will be difficult to unwind, in part because security cooperation, military acquisition, these run on you know, multi-year time frames. They don't turn on a dime with a new leadership. Uh, I also think that the Taiwanese public will constrain any Ho administration in, a, in closer relations with uh, China. Uh, you know, the public uh, now, saw, I think, 65% self-identify as Taiwanese only. And you can see a concurrent drop in terms of those who consider themselves to be Chinese and Taiwanese. Uh, those who consider themselves to be just Chinese alone on, on Taiwan are within the margin of error. Uh, and so there's a limit to how far any Ho administration can go in developing those economic relations with China. The KMT suffered pretty devastating losses after the 2014 Sunflower Movement, which was also inspired by the KMT administration tried to develop closer economic relations with China and it inspired, uh, uh, sorry, inciting a uh, political reaction amongst Taiwanese uh, that they don't want to get closer. And, you know, the trend line has, is even, has just continued. And so it's even more unlikely that a whole administration would be that successful in kind of creating those or advancing those economic relations with China. All right, Raymond, thank you very much for your insight today. Raymond Kuo, Director at Taiwan Policy Initiative and Senior Political Scientist at Rand Corporation.